Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome Bryson DeChambeau to the interview room. Bryson, congratulations on an impressive 2020. 10 top 10 since the start of the year, a win at the Rocket Mortgage in Detroit in July, and then that epic six-stroke win at the US Open at Wingfoot in September. How has your life changed now that you're a major champion? Well, again, thanks, Tom, for having me. I appreciate being here as always. It's uh, an honor to be here. I will say that how it's, I don't know, changed is kind of um, a difficult question for me to answer because I don't know necessarily how much it's changed for me. I, I, I love the fact, obviously, that I've been able to get a major championship and get that off my back, but I will say that it's not changed too much from, from my perspective other than the fact that I feel like now in major championships, I can go and attack them and not have this, you know, impending major championship looming over my head. It's like, okay, I've already gotten that under the belt and let's see how many more I can get. So that's really the only difference I feel like for me that's changed during this uh, whole time. Great. Well, it's been well documented. You're focused on distance. Tell us where you are on your journey and what we might expect this week. Well, that's a great question, and I will say that every day I'm trying to get faster and stronger, and I'm trying to hit it as far as possible. Um, I will say that I have no idea where the end game is on this. You know, I've only seen improvements in distance. I've only seen uh, strength increases. I've only felt better every day, so I really don't know where the end game is on this, but I will say that I am hitting it further now than I was at Shriners. I am hitting it further than the U.S. Open. Um, and I'm trying, you know, a driver this week that uh, may help me hit it even a little bit further. So we'll see. I don't know. It's still uh, up in the air. Great. Questions? Bradley. Bryson, good morning. Good morning. First of all, thank you for liking one of my teenage son's Instagram posts <laughs> that made his year. Great. My question is a two-parter. First of all, what do you think about playing without patrons? I know you've done it at other tournaments, but I mean Augusta National patrons. Do their roars help you? Hmm. And second of all, how would their absence impact the way you approach certain holes, perhaps? Well, it's unfortunate that the patrons are not here this year, and I always enjoy having them out rooting us on and cheering for us. I mean, especially the last time I played here, I made a hole-in-one on 16, and so interacting with the, the, the patrons there was pretty uh, amazing and fun and something that I'll never forget. So it's kind of sad that they aren't here. Um, I'm hoping that they'll be here for, for the next Masters. But as of this year, it's going to be different because I'm going to be able to hit it on certain lines where patrons would be. And I feel like that uh, it does provide me a little bit of an advantage in that case uh, to be able to hit into those areas without thinking about it at all. So you know, that would be the best answer I can give on that because you look at 18, right? I'm going to hopefully be able to hit it over those bunkers where the patrons would be. And um, another one would be 13 even. Um, you know, I can hit it through almost into 14 and, and they would be there. And so this is a unique opportunity, I think, this year. Thank you. Jimmy. Uh, yeah, Bryson. Can you give us a sense of some of the clubs in your practice rounds and that you've been hitting into some of these uh, greens here? Yeah. So you want to specifically the par fives or? Yeah, or uh, or or some of the par fours. Okay. Yeah, I mean, number three, I can get to the green. Number one, if I hit it in the fairway, I can have a 70-yard, 60-yard shot, especially, you know, I guess you could say even in wet conditions, I'm able to get it up that close to the green. Number two, I think I had seven iron in the other day. Number five, I had nine iron and eight iron. Yeah, it was it was into the wind, so it was eight iron that day. Um, number seven, this is a wet shot, nothing crazy. It was into the wind every day I played it. Number eight, I've had six iron in, as little as six iron in. Wow. Number nine, it's a 53 to 50, 48 degree for me. I'm trying to think here real quickly. Number 10, it's a nine iron at 
worst number 11 yesterday with Tiger and Freddie and JT. I had pitching wedge in. I asked Tiger, I said, what'd you hit in on 90, uh, in 97? And he goes, pitching wedge. I was like, that's cool. All right. Um, 13, I had pitching wedge in. I mean, I cut the corner drastically. So that's one of those where, um, you know, if, if you do cut it over and you can hit it high enough and draw it enough, you can gain a pretty big advantage there. Um, 14, nothing crazy. It was into the wind. 15, eight iron. Um, 17 into the wind. I hit eight iron as well. And then 18, I mean, you know, I hit it over the bunker. You could have 110 yards into the green. So, I mean, that's just a basic general principle of what, what it is. And, you know, again, I can hit it as far as I want to, but it, it comes down to putting and chipping out here. You know, th that is one of the things that I think people sometimes struggle to see. Um, as much as I can gain an advantage off the tee, I still have to putt it well and, and, and chip it well and wedge it well and even iron play it well. And that's what I did at the U.S. Open. If I don't putt it well at the U.S. Open, if I don't wedge it well, if I don't hit my irons close, I don't win that tournament. So it, it always comes down to making the putts at the end of the day. Doug. Bryson, winning, winning Wingfoot um, the way you did, if, if you were to win this week, what kind of impact or reaction do you think the game would have? Well, I think people would realize that hitting it farther is definitely an easier way to play the game. Uh, no matter what, athletics are always going to be the top of mind in sport. And no matter what sport you're in, um, I think those are the two biggest, biggest things that, you, that people would see from this. Um, I'm sure people would react to it. But at the end of the day, I'm only going to play under the rules of golf. And I'll always try and do my best to play under those rules in the best way possible. Secondly, what's the status of your 48 inch driver? Where do you well, I, I tested it yesterday for the first time and we've gone through at least three or four iterations of the shaft. And this is the most promising one yet. Uh, yesterday I was, I had about four to five miles an hour in ball speed uh, increase. I got my swing speed up to 143, 144 on the range yesterday. And the dispersions the same, the spin rate was even down. So, I mean, it looks really promising right now. I did not expect it to work yesterday. I was like, this is going to take even more time. But uh, it did work yesterday, and I'm not 100% sure if I'll put it in play yet just because of the unknown. It's so close to the Masters. But if it is an improvement on every facet of uh, launch conditions, then I don't see why not. We, we've received a remote question from Ann Ligori of WFAN. Do you feel that your unique approach has been embraced more following your U.S. Open win? I, I do believe that that is a, a fact. I think people are starting to see that no matter what it is, whether I do this or that or face on putting, it's always to try and get better. You know, no matter what I do, there's going to be times of failure. There's going to be times of success. Uh, but I'm going to fail a lot more than I succeed, and I feel like people are starting to understand that it's not just about me being quirky and doing things in my own way. It's about the process of trying to be better each and every day. And that's what I hope people can understand is that it's not necessarily just about me being different or trying different things. It's about me going through a process that will tell me if I'm doing the right thing or not. You know, if, if I go down a road and I, and it doesn't work, I'll pull myself back out and try something else. And I think that's what uh, hopefully can inspire a lot of people to say, you know what, I got to think about this hopefully in a new way and try and be as good as I possibly can to do my best each and every day. And if something fails and something's wrong, I pull myself back out and I try something else that'll make me better in whatever field it is. Um, and so that's, that's really what I, I hope people have understood. And, and I think people are starting to understand that after that win. Sam. Over here. Bryson, we, we've seen the DraftKings logo on the cap and yeah. uh, the, the billboard out on Washington. And I wonder how, if at all, have you seen the perception of sports gaming change uh, and evolve over the years? Well, I think there's a lot more people that are enjoying not only just betting, but, but the fantasy side of it where, you know, these fans are able to engage and feel like they're a part of each player's lives uh, by putting them on their team. And I think that's a really cool way to in engage fans 
into a new sport, you know, I guess you could say like golf, as golf has returned and come back and been more a part of the fantasy scene. I really think personally for me, that that was a no brainer to engage in, in that field because I'm all about growing the game. I want to grow the game. I think it's necessary in order for our game to survive and keep moving forward in a positive direction. So, you, you know, as it's grown and developed, I think that, you know, taking time off from the sport and having us be the first ones back has really enhanced the game of golf as well as the fantasy side and even the gambling side. I don't feel like it's necessarily, uh, actually, I think it's a positive thing. It gets people involved. It gets people, again, feeling like you're a part of their team. And personally, for me, I think it's a win-win with everybody. Tara. Bison, I wonder if you would share some of your strongest memories of your f up in the back to your Sorry, I right. Totally lost. There we go. That's Sorry. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, I was asking if you would share some of your strongest memories of your first Masters and, mm. you know, maybe <clears throat> what this version of Bryson might tell that version, which I guess mm. is a kind of way of asking how much you've changed or how much you've learned over the years. That's a great question. Looking back and 16, my fondest memory was on 12 when I hit that shot in there to a foot on Friday with Spieth and, you know, being close to the lead, um, the crowd and everything about it was, was just electric. I don't know what else to say. It was amazing that the patrons were incredibly supportive of the amateur having a chance to, to potentially do something special on the weekend. And, you know, I, I really feel that um, that was one of the most special moments as an amateur. And I also feel like being up in the crow's nest was one of the coolest experiences as well. Uh, being able to sleep there for a night and uh, experience that is a tradition that, uh, you know, needs to keep going on. And, and it's a tradition like any other. And I feel like it's something that every amateur needs to experience. Um, like I said to many amateurs this week, that it is the greatest, single greatest week of my life. Uh, no matter if it was a major championship win in the U.S. Open or winning PGA Tour events, I still say that that amateur week, that experience was the greatest moment in my life. Um, just from everything. I don't know how to explain it other than that. I would also tell him that patience is a huge part of success. You know, I wanted to succeed immediately right back in, and then, and my game wasn't ready. My brain wasn't ready. My body wasn't ready. Um, you know, it, I think people talk about how every five years you change as a human being. And, um, that is absolutely true. I mean, I've totally changed. And what I would tell younger Bryson is be patient and keep learning every day. Uh, those are the two things that I would tell Scott. Bryson, it doesn't sound like uh, you have that much need for longer irons in your bag this week. Is there any chance that you might carry two drivers as you're still trying to work it out? And also, hitting a driver that long and with the force that you swing it, does it take any toll on you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it absolutely takes a toll on my body. I don't think I'll put the 45. If I play one driver, I don't think I'll put the other driver in. Um, my three wood is long enough if worst case comes to worst, uh, that I'll just use that uh, on each hole and it'll be good enough. Um, but if I go the 48, I'll, I'll go the full way or 47 and a half. It's just a little over the half for reasons. But um, yeah, that's, that's what I'll do. Bryson, we have a remote question from Sylvia Audicio. Among your many 2020 adjustments, you appear to have a shorter routine before playing a shot. Mm. Can you take us through the process? Yeah, I mean, again, there's been great input on that from people around the world uh, for the past year, and I feel like I've done a good job of um, moving things at a faster pace. And uh, from a driving perspective, I just am trying to get up there like I'm in a batter's box, swinging as hard as I can, trying to hit a home run. Uh, I don't know if there's a better way to say it. You know, you look at these guys, Kyle Berkshire, they're up there, you know, getting uh, amped up before they hit a long drive, and that's what they do, and I'm kind of doing that, not to the fullest extent, but it uh, definitely helps hit the ball farther. On the putting greens, I mean, I'm able to uh, read things a little bit better and get into my routine, and, and I've practiced becoming a little bit quicker. 
and uh, you know it's paid dividends for sure. Steve. Yes, uh, Bryson, uh, I don't know how much uh, uh, curiosity and, and experimentation do you think you might have might have sparked here among your fellow professionals? And, <clears throat> and on the same score, uh, how much of this do you feel you have to kind of keep proprietary, even as open as you are about, about the changes you're making? There's a lot <clears throat> behind the scenes that I do that is kept proprietary that I won't talk about. All the things that are on the surface are things that are totally achievable for anybody, but take a massive amount of time to do. And it's very difficult to do. It's not just about getting stronger in the gym. It's about doing it in a way that enhances your body, not breaks it down. You have to still learn how to swing the golf club at a faster pace. You have to learn how to move it in a way that allows you to be comfortable with that and not hurt yourself as well. And the third thing is, is you have to learn how to do it straight. You know, those three things, I mean, it's very, very, those um, variables out. Will anybody figure it out? For sure. But behind those three things is, is a lot of work and a lot of proprietary information that, you know, for me has taken four or five years to truly figure out. It's really come in the past year, but it's, it's been this building block off of four or five years. Um, so it, it's not just a simple, oh, I'm going to try and swing it faster and I'm going to get faster this year. There's a lot of things that have to be in place and a lot of hours spent in the gym, on the driving range, hitting as many golf balls as possible, and also swinging in a way that uh, can make you be repeatable and not hit it everywhere. Mark. Hey, Bryson. I just have two um, things kind of unrelated, one of which is with regard to scrambling, if I'm not mistaken, at wing foot you were at the top of the – list there. Yeah. How different is the scrambling on, on these tighter lies in this grass versus what you dealt with at wing foot? Yeah, for me, it's a lot more bump and runs. Uh, around the greens, you have to be very creative, whereas at wing foot, you just kind of flop it up as high as you can out of the rough, and hopefully it sits and you, you missed it in the right place where you can get it somewhat close. Uh, out here, you know, you've got a lot of undulation around the green that'll you know, run offs and fall off, so you got to be able to bounce it into the grass and and control that but the grass is pretty sticky i know it's a little wet out there right now so it, it creates a different dynamic than at wing foot and i've got to be prepared for that i've got to go out and work really hard to figure out all the the little nuances of each bounce and how it works to get it to roll out a certain amount or but do i have draw spin on it or cut spin on this shot or it's it's a totally different dynamic than wing foot is it more difficult here would you say or is it what's the degree, degree of difficulty it's just a different style of short game, I guess you could say. Um, is it more difficult? Does it suit me better or worse? I don't know. Personally, I've always felt like I've been really good at bump, bump and running shots, but I've also been really good at, you know, flop shots out of ryegrass. And, and so, you know, it's just a dynamic that I have to go work on. And if I feel like I can execute those shots really well this week, I, I, again, my short game should be pretty good. Just one other thing Tom had mentioned at the very top of your journey to where you've gotten here uh, in terms of the, the length and whatnot. When you, when you told us last year at, uh, at in Vegas that you were going to come back a different player yeah. and a different look, what you did at Colonial, at that moment, um, did you think you could have taken it this far this quickly? And, and where were you in this? No, I did not think I would get, get this type of result uh, this quickly. Just... Uh, in the, the world of sports, stuff like that doesn't happen um, unless there's a super dedicated individual that has figured out some unique things, again, the proprietary information, <laughs> that has allowed me to have the gains, recovery, and uh, strength um, that I've been able to gain. You know, I mean, I've talked about it numerous times, you know, muscle activation techniques and what we're able to do there, I mean, we're 20 years ahead of everybody in the physical therapy to muscle therapy, I guess, in training, training world. Um, you know, what, what Greg has done is brought in 30 years of experience to figure some amazing stuff out. Uh, and I didn't realize how quickly I could gain until Greg told me. He was like, Bryson, I mean, if you go down the road with this and you work out properly and you keep doing it every single day and um, training the right muscles and balancing the system out, you'll find gains that have never been seen before. And I was like, okay, sure, whatever. And I kept going on the road and as time went on, I started to see some massive improvements really quickly and 
I was fortunate enough to have, you know, Como alongside of me, helping me with the golf swing stuff. And, you know, it all meshed together in a really beautiful way. Um, but no, I didn't expect to have these results this quickly. I thought it had been a three year, three or four year process of working out to get the same, same result. Ignacio. Hi, Bryson. Okay. Uh, do you think that the distant uh, you and the new generation of players are achieving uh, that that might lead to a, a change in the way the the championship courses are presented. What do you mean by that? I mean maybe uh, longer, uh, longer roughs and and yeah, longer rough. You, you think that thinner, thinner fairways? Yeah. So you're asking if the golf courses are going to change proportionately to what's going on with you know my gains? I guess you could say the length of the game, the distance. Right. That's okay. Uh, yeah, I think like I adapt to the rules of golf, to the golf courses. I think the golf courses are going to slowly adapt to, to what we're doing. And it's going to be all defined by the rules. You know, whatever personally the rules say is what how we're going to play and how golf, golf courses are going to be set up for the future. Will the rough get longer? I don't know. There's plenty of guys out here that don't hit it as far as me that still contend. I mean, Austin Cook, the week of Shriners, he still contended. You know, I was hitting it forever that week, and um, he beat me, you know. So, again, it's not just about driving. I mean, people have to – I think people have to really truly understand that there's still the putting aspect, the wedging aspect of it. And obviously, yes, length helps. But there are ways to, to play into um, other players' hands compared to me. But, again, you know, if somebody's hitting driver off the tee and I'm hitting – hybrid or foreign off the tee to hit at the same distance, that is, uh, you know, just an advantage that I will always have. Unfortunately, there's nothing you can really do about that. Um, from, from a course setup standpoint, people are going to try and do things. I don't think that there's really anything we can do anymore. Daniel. Bryson, when you look at that picture of yourself on that screen and compare it to <laughs> how you look today, yeah. uh, describe what kind of sacrifice have you, you've gone through to reach this level? Well, if you want to talk about the sacrifices, I will let you know that it was approximately two hours each and every day, at least two, two to three hours a day of, especially during quarantine time of dedicating my life to getting stronger, figuring out how to take out any pain in my body. Um, you know, and again, this all started from a back injury probably two years ago, two, three years ago now when uh, I had to withdraw from Valspar. And I couldn't get out of bed one day. I'm like, uh, what am I going to be like when I'm 30? I already feel like this. And so, you know, me trying to figure out stuff, I said, okay, instead of, you know, trying to figure out more of golf, let's try and figure out more of my body. And that's kind of when I went down this road. Um, and I slowly saw gains, but then I went to another level last year. And, and it, it's been a really, really interesting process that, um, you know, I look back a few years ago. Yeah. I mean, it, hopefully that is inspiration for a lot of people that, um, you know, you can, if you set your mind to something, you can really do it. And those sacrifices did not come easy. They, they were hours and hours every single day of trying to figure out my body, not just, you know, practicing golf, right. But after golf, after the four or five hours of practicing golf, there was, again, two, three hours of working out and figuring something out for my body um, to make me feel better. You know, even after speed training, I'd be just absolutely crushed, my body not feeling great at all, hurting everywhere. And then I'd go work out to figure out how to re-up those tolerance levels. Um, so over a year uh, now, I guess you could say every single day it was two, three hours uh, of time spent trying to figure out the body. You could... I mean, that was a sacrifice. That, that was a sacrifice. Instead of going to dinner and doing something with friends or whatever, I was in the gym working out. Yeah. Brendan. Uh, kind of a random question. You know, with, with golf being an inherently individual sport um, and you kind of now being at the peak of it, um, I wonder how do you think you would do as a professional athlete at this level but on a team sport where other individuals could dictate your winning and losing. Well, that's why I played golf because it was an individual sport. <laughs> I struggled with that in high school and, and junior high with team sports because I felt like sometimes um, 
I would give it so much that people would be like, what are you doing? Like, why are you so intense with this? And I've just always been super competitive in nature. And, and sometimes it's been tough for me to understand from a team aspect, especially when I was a kid, like, you know, why, why aren't you giving it like your 110%? And you can't really do that, but why aren't you giving it your 100%? You know, I see you could, you could do more. And so I was always very critical growing up of others. And that was a fault of mine that personally um, I have, I feel like I've gotten a lot better at, especially with having a team around me now with Connor and with Tim and Brett and Chris. And you know, I just feel like I'm trying to understand social dynamics a little bit better and how to enhance a team rather than, than anything else. Um, how do I maximize that? So that's a rabbit hole that I'm going down right now trying to figure out so I can get the best out of everybody. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I did not do well with, with team sports when I was younger. <laughs> We're going to only have one or two more questions. Ron. <clears throat> Bryson, do you have a sense of how much attention is on you this week? I mean, have you been somewhere or heard somebody say something that just sort of brought it into focus? And do you like having that attention on you? Is that something you embrace? You know, I don't know about that yet. I'm not sure uh, if I like it or not. I will say that, you know, for me, I'm trying, again, I'm trying to, Look at it as I'm still an underdog to the field. You know, anybody can win this week. There's a lot of unbelievable players out there. So, you know, I will never look at myself as some someone that is better than anyone out here um, until the scores are, are written in stone afterwards. Uh, it's just not what I do. It's not what I will ever do. And the attention that I've gained has been awesome. I love it. I think it's fun. But I've got to set myself back and go, look, again, every, anybody can win this week. And I have to keep normalizing to that because that's what I know is fact. It's nothing more than true statistics right there. You have plenty of unbelievable players that can beat me this week. And it doesn't mean that I'm going to win. I could be the favorite. I could be in, in dead last and, and, you know, still have an opportunity this week. So that's just statistics. And, um, how it plays out, I, I don't know. I don't know how it's going to play out. I'm going to give it my all. If I, you know, don't play well, I miss the cut, I'm still going to be gracious and walk off and go, you know what, I've still had a great year and I'm going to try and come back better next year. You know, that's the way I look at it. I don't, I'm not going to look at it any other way than that. I don't want to feel any other hype. I don't need to. Um, I don't think that there is personally on my own end because of those statistics. I, I won't look at it any other way. And Ryan? You mentioned your, your putting a couple answers ago. Um, what's the impact for you of not having those detailed green reading books this week? A lot more time spent on the greens these next few days. I'm going to go out there today, and uh, we know somewhat where the pins are going to be, but I'm going to try and uh, really get comfortable with those areas and in my mind know what they are um, just based on how much it's breaking off of the, the our starting line in that area. And so I'll do a really detailed um, – practice around that on each and every whole location over the next couple of days. Very hard. Yeah, absolutely. A lot harder. But, you know, growing up in college, we didn't always have greens books and things like that. And I played well then. And, you know, I've played here for the past few years and gotten pretty comfortable with the greens. So, you know, it is, it is another aspect of it. But at the end of the day, you know, I still go based off of my intuition most of the time I look at something, I go, okay, I think it's, but, uh, it looks a little like this. And, you know, the times where I've putted best have been where my intuition is matched up with reality and what it's actually doing. Cause sometimes they can be wrong. The greens books can be wrong. And, um, that's when I put my best, like a wing foot, those greens and slopes you had to, I, there's no way I could average out all those slopes. And, uh, you know, in the book, I had to intuitively do it and I was able to do it well there and hopefully I can do it well this week. Well, on that note, Bryson, wishing you all the best this week. Thank you. Thanks, Tom.